home, preaching, talking to them at the headquarters of the United Nations, giving them their marching orders. The United General Assembly unanimously approved a resolution to reinforce the role of privileges of the Holy See within the organization. The body approved the resolution without a vote Thursday. The measure recognizes the Holy See's right to participate in a more direct manner in the UN. It was without a vote because there was no opposition in the UN sessions and decisions. These rights had become a common practice for a long time, but were never registered in writing. The fact that they have now been recognized in writing is an important acknowledgement of the value of the work of the Holy See within the organization. It will be able to participate directly in any debate of the assembly without having to wait for approval of the regional groups and will have the right to reply in debates in which it is challenged directly or indirectly, it says. The Vatican will be able to co-sponsor drafts and resolutions and decisions affecting it, as well as to publish statements and receive communications from official channels through the United Nations General Secretary. Quote, the approval of the resolution recognizes at the same time the role of the moral guide which the Holy See has had in recent years on the international scene. He dictates the moral role, and they're willing and ready to receive it. What else did this Pope have to go on to say? Church and state, January 2001. Civil law must bow to church dictates, Pope tells legislators. The civil laws of all nations must be brought into conformity with God's law. And I ask the question here today, what version of that law are we talking about? What version? The civil laws of all nations must be brought into conformity with God's law. Pope John Paul II told thousands of legislators from nearly 100 nations on November the 4th. Who was he speaking to? Church leaders? No, he was talking to politicians from nearly 100 countries. It goes on to say, the Pope's comments came during a meeting with an estimated 15,000 public officials and legislators from 92 countries that their laws must conform to God's law and he means their version of the law well praise God we have a Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will step in and he won't allow these laws being passed and they'll step in and they'll stop this and they'll defend the separation of church and state is that right really this is former Chief Justice William Rehnquist he said the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history, a metaphor which has proved useless as a guide to judging. It should be, and frankly and explicitly, what? Abandoned. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, another member of the Supreme Court, Justice Antonin Scalia, the commandments are a symbol that government authority comes from God. And that's appropriate. It is a profoundly religious message. But it's shared by the vast majority of people, he said. It seems to me the minority has to be tolerant of the majority's view. And so if it says Sunday should be the day, then it should outrule, outrule, outrule the majority's view. Another Supreme Court, another Supreme Court justice. President Bush left smiles with Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, and John Roberts as they leave St. Matthew's Cathedral after attending the 52nd Annual Red Mass on Sunday. Here's the new Chief Justice of the Supreme Court with the Catholics, a Protestant president, so-called, with the Catholics coming out of a Red Mass. And by the way, we don't have the pictures right now, but there are several other Supreme Court justices that were at the Red Mass and attended that day. St. Louis Dispatch. As the second century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close, the Supreme Court is re redefining what religious liberty will mean in the third century. Broadly, the court's new approach helps conventional religions while hurting unconventional ones. Would we, our church, be considered conventional or unconventional? Unconventional. 
and it says the court's new approach helps conventional religions while hurting unconventional ones. USA Today, the House of Representatives, of course, they'll stop the Supreme Court anyway. So they think the House of Representatives passed legislation Thursday that would bar the Supreme Court from ruling on whether the words under God should be stricken from the Pledge of Allegiance. The bill, which was with the House passed 247 to 173, would prohibit federal courts, including the Supreme Court, from hearing cases involving the pledge and would prevent courts from striking the words under God from the pledge. This issue today may be the pledge, but what is the issue tomorrow is the Second Amendment, asked Representative from Illinois. Many of you have probably seen this by now. It's been out for quite some time. This is an editorial cartoon. It was put in many newspapers across the United States. This is George W. Bush standing behind the presidential podium with a handful of papers in his hand with a caption saying, here's one my conservative base is really going to like, a constitutional amendment requiring folks to attend church on Sundays. It's wake-up time. Ladies and gentlemen, it's wake-up time. We need to be awakened to the times in which we're living. Jesus said himself in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel, the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Jesus is referring us back to the book of Daniel. We need to study the book of Daniel. Where do you find the Sunday issue in the book of Daniel? We haven't been preaching it. We haven't been studying as we should. Praise God. My associate has put a five-night series together dealing with this issue and these verses in Daniel chapter 11. You need, to, you need these materials. You need to study like you've never studied. You need to pray like you've never prayed. The Sunday issue is coming, ladies and gentlemen, and for all intents and purposes, when the Sunday law comes for Seventh-day Adventists, it's too late to be prepared and get prepared for the test. We need to be prepared before that time. Then let him which he and Judea flee into the mountains, Jesus said. And Paul, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 5, Paul said, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. We should be in the light, not in darkness. These things should not be a surprise to you. You should have been studying and understanding where we are in time. And I'm praying that this is a wake-up call for you. I'm praying that you're going to make a decision this day that you're going to start studying. You're going to be praying. You're going to start sharing like you've never studied, prayed, and shared before so that we can be ready for Jesus to come. Coming again? Coming again. Yes, Jesus is coming again, and I want to be ready. How about you? If that's your desire, will you stand with me as we have our closing prayer? Kind Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity and privilege of knowing these truths. We thank you for giving us the signs of the time so we can know where we are so that we can be prepared and help others to be prepared for thy soon coming. Oh, bless us now as we are being dismissed. Bring us back together again uh, tonight for another meeting that we can go onward and forward to study these things as we go on with the great controversy, fact or fiction. Is it real or is it a fairy tale? Is it fiction? I don't believe so. Your word has proven that it is real. Dismiss us now with thy blessings, we pray. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.